Chapter 15 is on the salivary glands and tonsils. So we're going to look at the major salivary glands, which are in purple, which we'll look at. And we're also going to look at tonsils as well. So let's start with the salivary glands. When we look at salivary glands, there's two types. There is major salivary glands, which are big glands. And then there's minor salivary glands, which are everywhere else in the mouth. Our mouth is always wet. And the reason why it's wet is because these glands, they make saliva and they deposit saliva all over our mouth. So we have major ones or big ones. And we also have really small ones that are all around our mouth and even our tongue. So let's look at why we're learning about salivary glands and why we're learning about tonsils. The reason is because salivary glands, saliva, and tonsils, they're all really important for um, our mouth to be healthy. Our saliva has to be healthy. Our tonsils have to be healthy. Now, when we look at saliva, when saliva is secreted, when saliva comes out of the glands, it could either be serous or it could be mucus. Serous basically means that it could be thin saliva that comes out, or it could be thick, um, vicious, thick saliva, which is mucus. So there are cells within the salivary glands, and those cells could either be serous cells or mucus cells, which we will look at. Now the major salivary glands, which are these big ones, the parotid gland, the submandibular gland, and the sublingual gland, they make around 90%, anywhere from 85% to 90% of saliva. So majority of the saliva in our mouth comes from these major salivary glands. All the rest of the saliva comes from the minor salivary glands. When we look at the cells for serous and mucus, this is the serous cell. So this is what one serous cell would look like in a salivary gland. And this is what one mucus cell would look like. And we're going to examine this um, in more detail as we progress. So again, the major salivary gland, which is um, which are these three over here, when you look at um, how the, the basically the saliva is made here, and then it goes a long way before it is deposited into the mouth. There are ducts, there are long ducts that deposit the saliva into the mouth. But if you look at the minor salivary glands that are everywhere else, um, it could be on the palate, it could be on the buccal mucosa, which is the inner cheek, it could be on your labial mucosa, which is your inner lip. They have short ducts, which means they don't have to travel that long to deposit saliva, it just deposits it immediately right there. And again, just like we talked about earlier, the saliva could be serous, which is watery, or it could be mucus, which is vicious. Sometimes the saliva that comes out of the mouth could be a mixture, could be what we call mixed um, salivary flow, which is it's serous and mucus. It's thin and thick saliva. And another term for mixed um, secretion is serous demilune or serous demilune. So again, three different types of salivary flow that could come in the mouth could be serous, which is watery or thin saliva, could be mucus, which is vicious saliva or thick saliva, could be mixed, which is also known as serous demilune. Now when we look at these salivary gland, if you zoom into one salivary gland and you look inside the salivary gland, you're going to see these individual cells that kind of look like a pyramid shape. It's a triangular shape. So it's a pyramidal cell. You'll see a cluster of those. And this whole thing that we're looking at, this whole thing is known as an alveolus. Another term for this alveolus is an acinus. So it can either be called an acinus or an alveolus. And one cell, one cell is known as an um, acini or acinur. Okay, so A-C-I-N-I, or acinar cell. And what happens is these cells make the saliva. Then the saliva goes through a duct, and it goes through one, two, three different ducts, which we will go over. 
and then it gets deposited into the mouth. When we're looking at the serous cell, so when we're looking at one of these cells, which could be a serous cell, we'll notice that the serous cell, they mostly make um, a lot of protein in the saliva. They have a lot of protein in the saliva and very little carbs. So again, serous cells, they make a lot of protein, not so much carbs. When you look at a serous cell, they have something called zyg um, zymogen, zymogen granules. Zymogen granules are a type of what we call proenzyme. So zymogen granule is a proenzyme, which basically means it's a thing that needs to be secreted first, and then there's some biochemical activation that happens, and then what happens is we get this enzyme called amylase. And what amylase does is it breaks down all the carbohydrates. You know when we're eating carbs like bread and pasta and crackers, for example, the amylase is an enzyme found in the saliva that helps break that apart, but breaks down the polysaccharides, which is a type of carbohydrates, and it breaks it down into sugar so that we, it can digest properly. So again, the serous cells, they have this thymogen granule. Thymogen granule make, is the first thing that needs to be secreted and then amylase gets formed, which is an enzyme that breaks down carbohydrates. So this comes first, this comes second. And again, serous secretion is watery, thin secretion, thin consistency of saliva. When we look at mucus cells, mucus cells are more thick, right? We talked about this before, where it's a vicious saliva that comes out and the reason why it's vicious is because it has mucin it releases the cell the mucus cell releases something called mucin and mucin makes it very thick now when you look at the mucus cells the mucus cells are unlike the ser the serous cells is high in carbohydrates but low in protein so the way i remember this mucus has c carbohydrates has c so high in carbs but low in protein this is the cotton tip applicator. So you could use the cotton tip applicator and just um, rub it against any salivary gland and then look at the saliva that, that um, comes out of the um, gland and into the cotton tip applicator. And when you see, you could see based on um, what you're looking at with, so the cotton tip is stimulating the salivary gland and it's releasing saliva is coming out of the salivary gland and you're checking to see the consistency of saliva. So this is how you could test whether the gland is releasing serous saliva or mucus saliva or mixed, which is a mixture of both serous and mucus. So again, when we look at an asini, which is, or an asinus, which is one whole unit. Okay, so an asinus is basically a unit, a functional unit. It's a really important functional unit that makes saliva. If you look at one cell, it's, it's the shape of a pyramid. If you look at the serous cell, and you look at the nucleus of the serous cell, you'll notice that the nucleus of the serous cell is oval, or it could be round. And I'll show you another image of it looking round. But the mucus of a, sorry, the nucleus of a mucus asini, or a mucus cell, it's more oval, this is more round, but this is more oval, or it could even be spindle shape. Spindle shape is basically when it tapers off at the end. So it's oval, but it tapers off at the end. That's spindle shape. So again, mucus nuclei, is, uh, they could be oval, or they could be spindle shape, the nucleus. Whereas with serous cell, it's more oval or round. Usually it's round. And if you look at the cell and you stain it, for example, and there are ways um, that this can be done in the lab, where to stain the cell, or the cytoplasm of the cell, the, what you'll notice is that the mucus cells are stained lightly. So if we look at the mucus cell, mucus asini, it's stained lightly. But the serous cells, or the serous asini, they are stained deeply. There's a color to it, right? There's more of a color to the serous asini compared to the mucus asini. Here's another image of the two different cells. So if we look at the serous cell and you look at the nucleus, it's more round. But if you look at the nucleus of the mucus cell, it's more oval. So the cells are different. The, if you look at all the different um, 
parts of the cell, like the, Gol the Golgi apparatus, which are these over here, the RER, the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So the, the, you, can, you can take a few minutes just to compare, and you'll notice that they do look different between the two cells. So do you remember how we said that the serous demilun, this is like when you have mixed saliva, when you have serous and mucous saliva. What that looks like, if you were to look at it on um, microscopically on, on the salivary gland, what you'll notice is, actually let me just recap here. We know that this is the serous acinus, and we know that this is the mucous acinus. And how do we notice? Well, if you look at the nuclei, it's more spindle shaped with the mucus. If you look at the nuclei in the serous gland, it's more round shape. If you want mixed um, saliva, what happens is they put this other, so this is serous. The serous kind of goes on top. There's a layer or a cap, really. It's a cap of serous cell that gets formed right on top of the mucus acinus, and that will make the mixed saliva. The serous plus the mucus saliva comes out here, it goes into this duct, which is known as the intercalated duct, and then it travels along here, and then it goes to a striated duct, which is, and a duct is basically like um, a tube that's just taking the saliva, and then it's going to go out into the mouth. So it travels a specific way, and then it gets the saliva gets deposited into the mouth. Let's look at the major salivary glands. We're going to start by looking at the location of the major salivary gland. So if we look at the parotid gland, this is the one that's located at the side of the face. It's right in front of the ear. It's actually quite a big gland. The submandibular is right where the mandible is, so right underneath the mandible. And more specifically, it's along the angle of the mandible. So like the corner of the mandible is where you would see it. And then the sublingual, sublingual means underneath the tongue. Underneath the tongue, we have another major salivary gland. So parotid, submandibular, and sublingual. This is found under the floor of the mouth, so underneath the tongue. You'll see of the floor of the mouth, and that's where the saliva gets deposited from the sublingual gland. Let's look at the secretion. So when we're looking at the parotid gland and it comes out, and just as an FYI, the parotid gland, when it comes out, this is really, it, you'll, you could actually see it clinically. If you look at your maxillary, um, so maxillary second molar, right beside the maxillary second molar, if you look on the buccal mucosa side, you'll see the duct. You'll see the, uh, parotid, the parotid duct coming out in that area. So if you see like a fold of tissue up beside your maxillary second molar, that's your parotid duct. That's depositing saliva in that area. So parotid duct, what does it produce? It produces serous secretion, a watery secretion. Submandibular, submandibular the, um, glands, what is that secrete? That secretes a mixed secretion, so serous and mucus. And sublingual, so underneath the tongue, we get thick, viscous saliva, mucus saliva. Let's look at the size. We know that the parotid gland is quite big, right? It's the largest gland, but um, ironically enough, even though it's the largest gland, it only produces 25% of the saliva in the mouth. It's actually the submandibular, which is the medium-sized gland, the intermediate size, that produces the most saliva. This one, it travels through here and comes out here. And this one deposits 60% of the saliva. So it's a submandibular gland that gives 60%, that gives the bulk of your saliva, into the, that brings really the bulk of your saliva into your mouth. And then we have a sublingual gland, which is even smaller, and that deposits 5% of the saliva. And then the rest of the saliva comes from the minor salivary gland. So it could be in the palate, it could be in the buccal mucosa, labial mucosa, floor of the mouth, um, minor salivary glands. That's, the other, that's where you get the other 5%. So as we said earlier, when you look at one cell, that's known as an asini. And asini, they, they're all arranged together in a group or in a lobule. And they form uh, lobules or large lobes. So if we look at this, um, one, like if you're looking at a, the sublingual gland, for example, you zoom in, this is what it would look like. 
and then they have ducts. Okay, so the saliva gets released from those cells and then it travels through the lumen and into um, intercalated duct and then um, it goes into the striated duct and it finally gets deposited into the mouth. I just want to show you the ducts again. So this is the asini, this is the functional unit of um, the salivary gland. It makes saliva. It goes down the intercalated duct. Okay, so this is like the lumen, and then it goes into the intercalated duct. And then if you look at the intercalated duct, the, the cells are really, really tiny and small. They're like cuboidal cells almost. And then it goes into the striated duct, which is right here. So saliva is traveling this way. And the striated duct is more of a columnar cell. If you look at the cell, the cells are a little tall. And then it goes into the excretory duct. And then it gets deposited into the mouth. So this is how, kind of how it travels. It goes through many different ducts. Intercalated duct, striated duct, and then the excretory duct. And then it gets deposited into the mouth. Okay, so now um, let's look at the name of the ducts. So we said this is the parotid gland, which is the largest gland. But remember, it, even though it is the largest gland, it only deposits 25% of the saliva. Now this has a duct, and that duct is known as the Stenson's duct. The parotid duct is known as the Stenson's duct. The way I remember it is if you think of PA for parotid, ST for Stenson, and just remember past, that's how you can remember the parotid duct as the, it's the, the, the uh, saliva gets deposited through the Stenson's duct, which is this one right here. And this way, if you look at your maxillary second molar, um, you'll see the duct around there. Then we have your submandibular and sublingual gland. And again, their ducts, where do they go? They go right into the floor of the mouth. So underneath the tongue, we have the floor of the mouth, and that's where the saliva gets deposited into. The submandibular duct, is known as the Wharton's duct. Um, and again, I have a slide on this, but I'll just spell it out for you guys here. So the Wharton's duct is the one for submandibular. And sublingual ducts are really small. You can actually kind of see it here. These are your sublingual ducts. So this is a sublingual gland. This tiny ducts that just deposit saliva into the floor of the mouth. The submandibular gland, they're a duct, sorry, that it travels. It's, um, if we visualize it, it's kind of like this. So it's hard to see, but it would look kind of like this yellow duct that just travels from here and then comes out into the floor of the mouth. And that duct is known as the Wharton's duct. Now, when we're looking at the minor salivary glands, let's look at where they're located. So we have some lingual, so like on the front of the tongue. We have some on the buckle, which is like the inner cheek. We have some on the labial, which is the inner lip. And these minor salivary glands, the lingual, the buccal, and the labial salivary glands, they give us mixed salivary flow, so mucus and serous, thick and thin saliva. If you want pure, if you're looking for pure mucus, so thick saliva, where would you find that? You would find that where the purple area is, so where the palatine gland is, where the glossopalatine, near the tonsils, where that gland is, and even at the back of your tongue. That's so right, we have lingual tonsils, so around there we can find thick saliva. And serous or thin saliva is found right over here at the back of your tongue. And so you can see it's color-coded here, so you can see exactly where, what um, type of salivary flow comes out from the minor salivary glands. Okay, let's examine um, saliva, and we're going to look at these dif uh, different things that are listed here. So we're going to start with composition. When we look at the composition of saliva, there's very little proteins in saliva, but there's lots of different ions. There's like potassium, there's calcium, and they do so many good things to the teeth, to the mouth. The major protein is amylase, and remember, amylase is um, a protein or even like an enzyme that kind of breaks up the carbohydrates in our mouth. Our saliva also has defense cells like leukocytes and lymphocytes, which basically means that if there's any bacteria in the mouth, it will try its best to kill the bacteria because leukocytes and lymphocytes are white blood cells which fight infection. And um, there are 
um, epithelial cells. So remember like the lining of the mouth, the outer lining of the mouth or the skin of the mouth really, it needs there's cells there and the cells need to shed and then the bottom and it sheds and we get new cells. So saliva helps with shedding those cells, the epithelial cells, the outer skin cells. Lots and lots of different functions of saliva, as I'm sure you've, um, you're familiar with. But here's an interesting fact. We secrete three pints or um, six cups of saliva a day. So like three pints, which is a lot of saliva we secrete every day. And saliva is great, right? It has so many benefits. It washes off the teeth. It keeps our mouth moist, because um, which helps us with chewing, which helps us with swallowing food, right? If our mouth was dry, it would be really hard for us to eat. It, you know, kills bacteria because it's got like white blood cells that will kill bacteria. It makes a pellicle. A pellicle is basically um, a layer that's formed on the tooth and it protects the tooth. So basically, as soon as we're done brushing, right, immediately within seconds, a layer, a pellicle, which is a layer that is formed on the tooth, helps protect the teeth. That layer has lots of great things that help protect the teeth. And it buffers, so if there's any acid, acid if, you, if your mouth gets very acidic, there's a high chance you can get a cavity. So we'll try to buffer and prevent that acidity. So saliva is really good when preventing cavities and keeping your mouth healthy. So when we're looking at ducts, and I know we um, talked about this, what happens is the salivary gland makes saliva, so these cells really make saliva, and it goes into the intercalated duct, then it goes into the striated duct, and then it goes to, into the excretory duct. Let's look at this in more detail. There is an intralobular duct system and an interlobular duct system. So intra means um, within, inter means outside. So there is an intralobular duct system, so the intercalated duct and even the striated ducts, remember there was intercalated duct and then the striated duct, those two form the intralobular. They're like the ones that are closest to the asini. And then we have ones, um, then it goes to a kind of a bigger duct, which is known as the excretory duct. And that is known as your interlobular excretory duct. So like, you know where we were talking about Stenson's duct or the Wharton's duct, which is part of the parotid gland and submandibular gland respectively? That's part of the interlobular duct. So they're like in between lobes. Um, and so that comes out. Actually, let's look at a different picture here. We can see mucus saliva or mucus acinus here. This making mucus saliva. It goes to the intercalated duct. It goes to the striated duct. These two form the intralobular duct system. Then it goes to the bigger duct, which is known as the excretory duct, and the excretory duct is known as the interlobular excretory duct. That's where you would see the Stenson's duct, that's where you would see the Wharton's duct. And then it goes into the mouth, um, and saliva is deposited inside the mouth. There's a, there's a system that it follows. So when we're looking at the innervation of the salivary gland, which basically means that there are nerves that got us, that have to stimulate the salivary gland. What you're going to see is that, and this might be um, a recap for you, when we learned about the sympathetic autonomic nervous system and the parasympathetic autonomic nervous system, you may remember this, the sympathetic autonomic nervous system is the fight or flight response. Um, this is when, so S for sympathetic, S for scared. So when we're scared, when we're being chased by a bear, when we're being chased by a robber, for example, many different symptoms happen, right? Our eyes pop open, our saliva kind of dries up. But the parasympathetic, this is the rest or digest system. This is the way I remember this is P for parasympathetic. Oops, I meant to circle P and P for peace. When you're peace, so when you're at peace, then you're more relaxed. So think about it. When you're relaxed, when you're peaceful, we like think about when you're sleeping. Sometimes we drool a lot, so we get more saliva, um, stimulate saliva. Your salivary flow gets stimulated in the, when the parasympathetic autonomic nervous system is activated, which is when you're calm. But when you're scared, the sympathetic autonomic nervous system gets activated, and there's all these symptoms happen. So what this is saying over here is that when the sympathetic autonomic nervous system is activated, when you're scared, the saliva that actually comes out, if, I mean, usually there's no, the saliva kind of just dries up, or, or sorry, you don't get much saliva because you're scared and your mouth dries up. 
But if you were to get saliva and you were to examine it, you'll notice that the saliva is organic secretion, that the saliva is a protein rich. But when you're relaxed, which is when the parasympathetic autonomic nervous system kicks in, the saliva that comes out is watery. And think about it, right? We drool a lot when we're relaxed, when we're sleeping. It's a watery secretion that could come out. So parasympathetic creates a watery secretion. Sympathetic autonomic nervous system, when activated, releases an organic secretion, which is protein-rich, so more thick saliva. So again, this is the acidness and it's uh, making saliva and the saliva just goes down the duct. But right outside the acinus, we have this, the cells and these cells are called the myoepithelial cells. And this functions like a muscle. What it does is it squeezes the, um, so it squeezes the acini, the cells. And when it squeezes it, the saliva just gets pushed out, right? It's like squeezing action. So it works like a muscle to squeeze the acinus. This whole group of cells are known as the acinus, and it helps with secreting saliva. So it's like kind of like a muscle. It's a cell that works in a type of a muscle function because it squeezes it, squeezes the acinus. Okay, let's look at tonsils now. So there are three main tonsils that we're going to examine. There's actually four altogether, but we're just going to examine three. There's the pharyngeal tonsil, which is near the pharynx or the back of your throat. There's your palatine tonsil. This is the common tonsil we think about when we talk about tonsils. And then there's your lingual tonsil, which is just underneath your tongue. So let's look at each of them individually. Do you guys remember learning about the Waldire's ring? So if I were to draw a ring right over here, I would see... Um, four different tonsils. I would see the pharyngeal tonsil, which is at the back of your throat. I would see the tubule tonsil. I would see the palatine tonsil, which is again at the back of your throat. And I would see the lingual tonsil. Now, when you look at each tonsil, <clears throat> in the middle of each tonsil, there's something called a germinal center. So like right in the middle of each tonsil, Imagine a center, a middle part, which is known as a germinal center. And what germinal centers do is they make lymphocytes, which is a white blood cell that help fight infection. Tonsils are great because what tonsils do is they try to fight infection. So when you have healthy tonsils, that's great because it tries to fight infection. And the tonsils are covered with skin, and we'll, I'll show you a picture of it with epithelium. This is the palatine tonsil. This is the tonsil we're most familiar with when you go to the doctor and they say, ah, or when you go to a dentist and they say, ah, we're looking at the palatine tonsil. This is your palatine tonsil. And here, this is actually inflamed. Children's um, tonsils get inflamed really easily. And when you look at the tonsils, they have deep um, crypt. A crypt is basically like a, a chamber or a vault or like a, a, like a big hole, really. This is a crypt right here. And so what happens is this crypt is not necessarily a good thing because it can be filled with bacteria and stuff like that. So with the palatine tonsils, there are some glands that make saliva and try to wash out the crypts. So it'll flush out the crypts at the top, but it might not go that deep, right? It might not go that deep. If there's bacteria deep inside, it's not going to flush it out. And so this is why it, we get, you know, kid children especially can be prone to infection because bacteria and stuff travel down the deep crypt and that becomes infected. And it can look like this, like really inflamed, big, um, and it has a white like things on it. I don't know if you can see that here, but there should be like white striations on it too, which can, uh, which basically just indicates that it's inflamed. Your lingual tonsils, which is just underneath your tongue, so the very back, the posterior third of your tongue, there um, is, and it's right in front of your epiglottis, is your lingual tonsil. And they have crypts too. So here we can see the crypt. It is wide mouthed crypt. So it's quite wide. Like if you look at the top part of the crypt, it is quite wide. What's nice about the lingual tonsil is there's actually a duct, a salivary duct, right in here um, that 
takes like saliva just comes out of the crypt whereas with the palatine tonsils there is no um, salivary duct that comes out over here but with the lingual tonsils there's a salivary duct that comes out here which means that it'll keep washing it'll keep cleaning out all the bacteria because the saliva just comes and washes it all off so lingual tonsils are rarely ever inflamed because the salivary flow there's a duct that just comes here and the duct has saliva that just washes away the crypt washes away this chamber, washes away this hole, um, and so it's very rarely inflamed. And lastly, let's look at the pharyngeal tonsils. Just, you may have heard the term adenoids. Adenoids and pharyngeal tonsils are the same thing. You gotta really, um, it, it's really hard to see, but this is the adenoid tonsils right up here, over here. And so if doctors look at it, they have like a light and a dental mirror and everything to see the adenoids. And interestingly enough, the adenoids don't have any crypts, don't have those long crypts. So that's always a good thing, right? It doesn't get infected as much. However, if you're a child, you, this could get infected. So the pharyngeal tonsil um, is subject to infection in childhood. The tonsillar tissue around this area, um, this is known as the tubal tonsil. So sometimes we can see tubal tonsils um, around that area. But interestingly enough, it has no crypts. There's no long holes there. It does have folds. You can see folds of tissue um, that looks like cloughs. So, you know, um, it, there are folds, which means bacteria could kind of technically get in there, but it's not as um, bad as your palatine tonsils where we have those deep crypts. So why do we, what's, what's so important about tonsils? Why do we have tonsils? Well, when we have healthy tonsils that are not inflamed, it's really, really good because it produces lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are a type of white blood cells. They are used to fight infections. So if you have bacteria inside your, the back of your throat, for example, they will try to kill it. So if we look at lymphocytes, lymphocytes, um, they make antibodies. So these are antibodies. Antibodies are good because what antibodies do is they find antigen, which is bad, and they'll kill the antigen. They destroy antigens, which are like bacteria or viruses and stuff like that. They'll try to kill us. So antibodies are good to have. Um, lymphocytes can turn into T cells and B cells. And then um, you may have learned about this in other uh, courses, but B cells and T cells are great because they try to kill bacteria as well. So lymphocytes kill bacteria. All right, that's it. Hope that was uh, helpful for you guys.